It's time for us to start. We're glad you're here. Appreciate everyone being here. Appreciate those that join us online as well. As you probably already know, we're studying in the book of Jeremiah. We are ready for chapter 47 uh, in the book of Jeremiah. If you have a workbook, you were on page at the bottom of page 34 is where it starts. Uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. Our Father, we just thank you so much that we can be here this evening and study from your word and just pray you'll help us as we look at the book of Jeremiah that we will apply the principles to our lives and want to serve you and want to do what's right. We know that we are held accountable before you and we pray you'll be with us. We pray that you'll be with our nation, bless our leaders, help them to want to look to you and help us to be able to live in peace. We pray, Father, that you'll be with those that are sick. We have several of our number that are sick and getting over surgery and taking treatments of various kinds. And we just pray your blessings on each one and pray for those that are about to have surgeries. Be with us in our study tonight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I mentioned that we are in chapter 47 or start ready for 47, but I want to go back to chapter 25 uh, to start tonight. Uh, if you want to turn back to chapter 25 and begin reading at verse 15. Chapter 25, begin reading at verse 15. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, says to me, Take this cup of the wine of wrath from my hand, cause all the nations to whom I send you to drink it. And they shall drink and stagger and go mad because of the sword I will send among them. Then I took the cup from the Lord's hand and made all the nations drink to whom the Lord sent me. Jerusalem and the cities of Judah and its kings, its princes, to make them a ruin, a horror, a hissing, and a curse as it is to this day. Pharaoh, king of Egypt, his servants, his princes, and all his people, and all the foreign people, all the kings of the land of Uz, all the kings of the land of the Philistines, even Ascalon and Gaza and Ekron and the remnant of Ashdod, Edom, Moab and the sons of Ammon and all the kings of Tyre and all the kings of Sidon, kings of the coastland which are beyond the sea and Dedan and Tina and Buzz and all who cut the corners of their hair and all the kings of Arabia and all the kings of the foreign people who dwell in the desert, kings of Zimri, all the kings of Elam and all the kings of Media all the kings of the north, near and far, one with another, and all the kingdoms of the earth which are upon the face of the ground, and the king of Shishak shall drink after them. If you look at this listing, we are going through that, and not every one of them will we cover, but uh, we've, so, so we have seen over and over and over and over and over again uh, what's happening to Judah and that they're fixing to be taken captive, that they're going to be destroyed because they're not faithful to God, they're not serving God, they're worshiping idols uh, because of the immorality and the ungodliness in their lives uh, that's, that's happening as well. Uh, and, and so uh, we've, we've seen that. And then uh, in, in the lesson... Uh, In 46, chapter 46, uh, it was addressed to Egypt, and uh, it was saying that Egypt was going to be destroyed, which is what we just read from that prophecy. And then chapter 47 is the Philistines, chapter 48 is Moab. So we're seeing this, and then 49 is several of them. It sort of takes in all the kingdoms, uh, is what it does. And so... Uh, God said way back there, you know, I'm going to punish all these people. Uh, what does that tell us about kingdoms of the earth and people of the earth, wherever they are? They'll pass away. They'll pass away, okay. It, it, tell, it also tells us that everybody's accountable to God. You know, when we study... Pretty much when we study the Old Testament, what nation of people do we focus on? We focus on the, the Jews. Uh, Israel, Judah, or a combination of the two. Uh, and, or maybe the, the kingdom before it divided and 
And so we focus on these people in particular, and why do we do that? Okay, they're God's people, and that is the focus of the Old Testament. So when you read through the, the Old Testament, when you read through the history of the Old Testament, the focus is on the Jewish people. Now, it, it is through God's people then that the Messiah comes. And the story of the Bible is the coming of the Messiah. That's, that's what the whole story about is about in the Old Testament, is, is leading us up to the coming of Christ, uh, the Messiah. And, and so... God has His people that He's working through to do that. And it's easy for us in our minds to, to think, okay, God's just ignoring everybody else. You know, occasionally it'll mention like He does with, with Assyria or with Babylon or some one other nation. He says, okay, I'm going to use these people to punish my people. I'm going to use this nation to punish my people or whatever, and the Philistines and Egypt and others at different times. And, and so other than that, though, other than God using them to punish His people, it, it's sort of like, if we're not careful, that God just sort of ignores all of them and, you know, and, and they're just out there and, and it doesn't really matter you know, that they're wicked. It does matter that they're wicked. God has revealed Himself to everybody. Now, He did not reveal Himself in the same way to the Egyptians and to the people up in Babylon or the people of Assyria uh, or the Philistines in the same way as he did to, to Israel and to the Jews. He had his own special laws. He had his own special people. He had his own special prophets. And all of them focused for the most part with the Jewish people, although not entirely. But, but God did reveal himself to everybody. If you remember, Paul says over in the book of Romans uh, in the first chapter, he, he says that all these people that ignore God and refuse to acknowledge Him as God or give Him thanks as God are without excuse. Now, why are they without excuse? Okay, they should know about God. Now, how, 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 do, how can they know about God? If they didn't have the word revealed to them, given to them like the Jews did, how could they know about God? From the okay, from the prophets. And Paul says just by creation. They're without excuse because they can look up in the sky and they can see the evidence of God. They're without excuse because they can look around them and everywhere in nature they can see the evidence of God. And so even though they may not be held accountable in, for the, exactly the same thing, the Jewish people were held accountable to the law, but the, the Gentile people, that is everybody other than the Jews, were still under what we usually refer to as the patriarchal system. That is, the fathers of each family were responsible for, for seeing that their children and their family followed God. And... Yeah. We don't know their background other than they were three wise men out of the east. And that's the end of their story. Yeah. They, they were three wise men or magi from the east, which means they probably were from over or around somewhere where the Medo Persian, Mesopotamia. yeah, Mesopotamia, somewhere over in that area is where they came from. How would these wise men have known about the coming Messiah? They said, you know, the, the promised Messiah is born. We've come to see him, the promised king of, that God's been promising. How would they know about that? Do what? Angels, okay. Could be. Uh, yeah, somebody brought them a message. And it may be, and I'll I tell you what, one and this is, this is some speculation with a little bit of what, what is revealed mixed together. Daniel was chief of the wise men. So it's very likely that Daniel taught the wise men in the east about God. We know that he had these various visions about the coming Messiah, about the different kingdoms and all of that. 
how much he shared that with the other wise men and how much that got handed down from one group of wise men to the next through the years, I don't know. But that is a very real possibility as to how these wise men knew that there was a Messiah that was coming. Uh, now, how did they know that the Messiah had come? That's, that's a whole different thing. That, that would be uh, the, the angels or the star or whatever. We saw a star in the east, they said. Yeah. Uh, but you know, I, I don't know. I, like I said, I just read that as a as one possibility, and to me, it may, has some logic to it. You know, it seems like it's very possible. That, uh, but but these people are held. And the whole point of what I'm saying, <laughs> I didn't mean to get off totally, but the whole point of what I'm saying is that God holds everybody accountable. Now. Is he going to hold everybody accountable exactly the same? I, you know, I, that's up to God to, to, to answer that. I, I can tell you what I think and what I understand the Bible to teach and so on. Uh, you know, it, and, and it seems to me that uh, since the coming of Christ that, that the Bible teaches that only through Christ can, can you have salvation. There's no other name under heaven whereby we can be saved. And so I think that they have to know about Christ. I don't think that you can know about Christ through the nature. Uh, you'd have to have that revealed to you from the written word, uh, or at least verbal word handed down uh, to, to know about Jesus. Uh, but I don't know any way to, to justify saying that, that people could be saved without Jesus because the Bible plainly teaches that you must come to, through him. I'll tell you a real quick story uh, about uh, that shows our arrogance. Uh, there was a friend of ours that was on a, a trip in, uh, I think it was India, and he was traveling by himself, and he was way out in the middle of nowhere, and he, he just finally realized he was totally lost, <laughs> didn't have a clue. And he saw this guy with an ox cart. Uh, coming down the road and he thought well I'll stop and see if maybe he speaks English and maybe he can give me directions he stopped uh, his car he, he asked the guy do you speak English I said yes I do in six other languages <laughs> uh, <laughs> this guy was a professor and he had his doctorate degree and he thought you know he was pretty smart he said boy he brought me down quick <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, this guy, he really wasn't, he, he was a very well-known and recognized professor, but he also was a very down-to-earth, humble person. Uh, but I thought that was sort of, it, it illustrates what you're saying, you know. It, uh, okay. Anyway, I just I wanted to go back and, and read this and just point out this fact that, you know, God holds everybody accountable. And now we, we see that that's what's happening here uh, in the very first verse of chapter 47. He says, That which came uh, as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet concerning, uh, and so against what people does God now speak through Jeremiah? The Philistines. Okay. I find it interesting that the, the Philistines, as compared to the Egyptians, for example, the Philistines were not a huge nation. Uh, they, they actually were much smaller than Israel in its heyday. Uh, so the Philistine nation was not a real big nation. It was made up pretty much of five major cities 
uh, and each city had its king, and, and that, was, that was all there was to the, the land of the Philistines. Pretty much had little outlying towns around it, but it was pretty much just those five major cities. Uh, but they were always a thorn in the side of Israel. From, from the time they got to the promised land uh, until they were taken out, the Philistines were always there and always a thorn in their side. Uh, when, when you think about the Philistines, what Old Testament men and events does that name bring to your mind? Okay. Think about David and Goliath. Yeah. That, that was, of course, the first one I thought about was David and Goliath. That's, uh, Goliath, of course, was a Philistine, and this is what they were known for. They, they, many of the Philistines were descendants of a guy named Anak, and Anak was a giant, and his descendants were giants. And so there was a whole bunch of the Philistines that were seven feet plus tall. Uh, big, big people. And that's, that's one of the reasons why they were as fierce as they were. Is, uh, people were afraid of them because of the, the height of their, their armies and their soldiers. Do you think about anybody else? I had another one popped in my mind almost immediately too, and it wasn't, wasn't a man though, it was Delilah. Samson and Delilah. Uh, in fact, Samson went down to the land of the Philistines and had a couple of different women down there, but Delilah is the one that we usually think of. All right. God tells them in verses 2 through 4, from the blank a mighty army will come to blank all the blank and blank, 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 blank. From the... From the north, okay. Now, uh, we have seen before this, this designation of a nation coming from the north, and who is that talking about? The nation coming from the north. Uh, no, no, this, he's, this, this is who's going to come to defeat the Philistines. The nation from the north is Babylon. They're, they're referred to throughout the book of Jeremiah as the nation from the north. People coming from the north, okay? From the north, a mighty army will come to blank all the blank. To, okay, spoil or destroy all the Philistines. Depending on the translation, there's several different words you might put in there. Spoil, destroy, uh, beat them up, wipe them out, whatever. Uh, going to destroy all the Philistines and to... Blank from blank and blank. It's going to cut off. cut off. Okay, that's what I put too. It's going to cut off from what two cities? Tyre and Sidon. Every oh, just read it all and put it in our words. Okay, every helper or ally, depending on the translation you have. So he's going to cut off every helper or ally that remains. Tyre and Sidon were seaport towns, and they were very often called on to help the Philistines and to help other countries. Uh, and so most of the nations around there, plus they had quite a bit of wealth because they were seaport towns and they had a lot of trading going on in and out. And, and so they were very often called on to help and, and these other nations around them would make alliances with them and so on. And what he's saying here is that when Babylon comes in to destroy the, the Philistines, they're going to cry out to Tyre and Sidon, hey, come help us, and they're not going to do it. They're not going to have any help. Uh, God's going to cut off Tyre and Sidon so that they can't come and help them. Uh, and so... As you read this, it looks, it looks very plain then that the one who is the spoiler, the one who is the destroyer, the one who is do, inflicting all of the damage is the Babylonians. However, in verse 4, who is actually the spoiler? God is, yeah. God is, the Lord. 
And so it, it says there in verse 4, uh, on account of the day that is coming to destroy all the Philistines, cut off from Tyre and Sidon, every ally that is left, for the Lord is going to destroy the Philistines, the remnant of the coastland of Kaphtar. So it's the Lord that's behind it. Have you ever wondered when there are wars going on today and when one nation conquers another nation or one nation is destroyed or whatever, if God is behind that? You know, we, we don't usually talk about it and, and it's sort of, like, sort of like some other things that we've talked about at times. Since God doesn't specifically tell us as He's telling Jeremiah that this is what I'm doing and this is how it's going to happen, well, then anything that we say is speculation. Uh, it may be educated speculation, uh, but the fact is it's still somewhat speculation if God is doing this to carry out His purpose or His will for whatever reason. And uh, does God use wicked people sometimes to punish good people? Yeah, He did. In fact, several of the prophets question God about that. You know, how can you send the Babylonians in here or the Assyrians in here to destroy your people when they're a whole lot more wicked than what we are? Yeah. I kind of like to remember the story when uh, God doesn't act quickly. Okay. Sometimes it may take years before he answers the question, like when they did the ten plagues, that took forever. Yeah. But he finally got the job done or decided it's okay. Right. So he's not this. He's not instant. He's not in a hurry. Uh, he carries out his plan. He's got patience. And uh, that's, that, that's the other part that makes it difficult for us to know is because as you study through the Old Testament, a lot of times the plan of God to carry out something takes several hundred years. I mean, it's not like, you know, he, he said, okay, I'm going to do this and tomorrow it happens. Sometimes it did, but, but a lot of times it took several hundred years. You know, when you talk about the patience of God, you're talking about several hundred years that God waited on Israel and Judah to repent before He finally did punish them. And He lets people live long that He wants to be. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and the, the problem is, you know, it's hard for us to, since we don't know what God's doing behind the scenes, it's hard for us to say. But I, I have to believe, since I do believe that God is the one who puts rulers in and God is the one who takes rulers out according to Romans 14, then I have to believe that when these things happen, God is working behind the scenes. Why? I don't know why. You know, why did he let Hitler do what he did? Why did he let some of the others that have come along do the things that he's done? I don't have any idea why, because he hadn't told us. Uh, I do believe that he's behind it because, you know, Paul said that there's not any ruler that's in power that God didn't let him come to power or God didn't put him there. Uh, whoever he is, good, bad, wicked, indifferent, whatever he is. One of the judges that uh, didn't do what God told him to do, <clears throat> and uh, he had to go home and sacrifice his daughter. Yeah, you that know, was Jephthah. How hard was that? Yeah, Jephthah. Yeah, Jephthah. Made, made the vow that whatever came to meet him, when he, if he was victorious when he came back from battle, whatever came out of his house to meet him, he would offer up as a sacrifice. Yeah. Yeah. Then uh, I wasn't in the Bible class, but a friend of ours was that told me that they were studying that in Bible class, and the teacher asked, "Why in the world do you think Jephthah made a vow like that?" And somebody said, well, "Maybe he thought his wife would come out and meet him." <laughs> you didn't think that was funny? I didn't make that vow. It wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, question number three what is indicated by the expression baldness and cutting yourselves in verse five it says baldness has come upon Gaza Ascalon has been ruined a remnant of their valley how long will you gash yourself what, what is she Talking about this, she gives us a couple of passages, Leviticus 21.5 and Deuteronomy 14.1, neither of which really answer her question, 
but they do tell us something about the gashing and the cutting and, and shaving the head and, and so on. What did the law of Moses say about shaving their head or cutting themselves? It said they were not to. That, that, was, a, that was a shame and they were not to do that. That was one of the common practices, especially in times of stress or times of grief, many of the people would cut themselves and they would shave their heads uh, and, and it would be a way of mourning or a way of... You remember when Balaam... Uh, not Balaam, I'm sorry. Uh, when Elijah on Mount Carmel uh, challenged the prophets of Baal, and they were going to build an altar and whichever God sent down fire and burned the sacrifice, that is God. So the prophets of Baal began theirs, you remember, and, and, they, and after noon they began dancing and then it says, and they began cutting themselves till the blood gushed forth. That was, that was their way of begging and pleading and showing their humility to Baal and saying, you know, we trust you, do this. Uh, and, and so it was, it was uh, something that the pagans did. Under the Old Testament law, God said, you don't do that. Uh, and, and I thought it was interesting that shaving their head was also included in that. Uh, I was thinking about Absalom's pride. Okay. Pride yeah, Absalom's pride was his long hair, yeah. Uh, I, I think it would depend on why and why, how and what and all that. I don't know. Just because it's not allowed under the Old Testament law does not mean that it would be wrong to do it today necessarily. Uh, the, if, if it's wrong, it would come under, in my mind, if it's wrong, it would come under the heading of your body is the temple of God and don't, don't defame, degrade, deface the body because it's the temple of God. Uh, I think, personally, I think tattoos would come in that category. Uh, the markings, and again, that's condemned in the Old Testament too, is making the markings on your flesh and that kind of stuff. So was this in bonds with bonds? The shaving their heads under those conditions, yes. Self-sacrifice tells you this is what God gives. Okay, yes, yeah, self-sacrifice, yeah goes against what God has given. Uh, however, I don't think that it's just the idea of being bald that is wrong. It was the way they were doing it and why they were doing it that would make it wrong. Because he, he specifically says, like, if somebody in your family dies, don't shave your head, don't cut your bodies. That's what the pagans did. And he says, don't do that. It's a real problem, isn't it? Uh, and, and it's not just teenagers and young people. It's a lot of older people do it too. But I think you're right. I think the whole point, 
uh, even though I think God says don't do these things because it is a shame, because it does degrade the body, because it does uh, show a lack of trust in Him. I think that, that what this verse is saying is just what you said, that this idea of baldness, this idea of cutting themselves is they will be put to shame. Uh, they'll be defiled, they'll be profaned, they'll be, and the, it shows their mourning, the fact that they, 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 they feel totally helpless. Uh, Uh, hair, hair was an interesting thing when we were growing up. Uh, yeah. It did. Uh, it, it's, it's, in fact, Tommy, probably yours would be considered too long on the sides because it's touching your ears. That's, that's, uh, <laughs> back in those days, uh. Yeah, that's, uh, it, it did, in fact. All right, anything else on the, the Philistines? It looks to me like one other thing here, verse 6. He says, Ah, sword of the Lord, how long will you not be quiet? Withdraw into your sheath, be at rest, and stay still. Is, is that a cry for mercy? As I read it, I just wonder, is it, and I, I put down verse 6, a cry for mercy question mark, because it just seems to me that's what that is. And the response then is verse 7, how can it be quiet? When the Lord has given it an order against Ascalon, against the seacoast, there he has assigned it. And so I don't know if it's maybe the Philistine response in saying, you know, give us mercy, for, you know, be, be, stop all of this. Or if maybe Jeremiah was saying it to God, or maybe it's just a rhetorical question that God put in Himself. Uh, but, but the answer comes back very quickly and says, no, it's not going to be stopped because God has given the order and it's going to be carried out. All right, anything else on chapter 47? Yeah. Yeah. That's there's one verse I think about Shamgar. He's one of the judges. He killed six hundred of the Philistines with an ox goad. Uh, of course, Samson killed a thousand with the jawbone of a donkey. Uh, and then he says at, at the end, he when he brought the the temple of their god down on him. And all their their officials, it says he says he killed more people then than he did his whole life put together. So that was a, a major catastrophe then. Uh, the 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 fact is, when God says a nation is going to be destroyed, it's going to be destroyed. There have been some mighty nations that we, we mentioned last time. You know, Egypt has been there. It's one of the few countries in the world that's been around. They may be the only one that's been around as long as it has. I don't know. But it's, I mean, it's been there since way, way, way back in the earliest Bible times. You start reading about Egypt. Abraham, uh, when he went to Canaan, you know, remember God told him to leave Ur, go to Canaan? He did, and there was a famine. He went down to Egypt. So Egypt was already a, a, a nation at the early days of Abraham. Uh, and And so... You know how long it had been there? I don't know, but it's still there, uh, and that's that's pretty amazing when when you think about that. With all the other nations that have been in history uh, that have come and gone, and some of them been a lot of them have been much bigger and mightier and stronger than Egypt ever thought about being, and yet they they all destroyed. Well, you know, God certainly used famine and plague to move the nations. Right. Uh, they were where he wanted them to be forced in by that, which wasn't obvious to them probably at that time. Yeah. Yeah, it's not always, it wasn't always an outside invader that came in and conquered. In fact, Rome self destructed, you know, from within. It was, uh, it wasn't anybody that came from the outside. 
All right, anything else on, on 47? All right. 48, the prophecies in this chapter are against what country? Okay. Against Moab. The Moabites were descendants of whom? No. That's the Edomites. Yeah. Lot. Okay, Lot. You remember after God told Lot to leave Sodom and Gomorrah, told him not to look back. He was taking his wife, his two daughters. On the way out, his wife looked back. She turned to a pillar of salt. They went to a town called Zoar. Uh, they didn't stay there for just a little while. They were afraid that the people would not accept them or be gracious to them. And they went and lived in a cave. So it was just Lot and his two daughters. His two daughters got to thinking about it and they said, our father's getting old. Uh, and there's not going to be any descendants, and we need to go into him, and we need to both have a child by our father. So they got him drunk. The oldest one went in to him and uh, one night, and then the next night the, the second daughter went in uh, to him, and uh, they both ended up being pregnant by their father. Uh, the oldest daughter had a son. She named him Moab, and so it was... The Moabites, the nation of Moab, were descendants of Lot and his oldest daughter. The second daughter <coughs> had a son, and his name, she named him Ben-Ami. And the Ammonites are the descendants of Ben-Ami. So that would be descendants of Lot uh, and his second daughter, his younger daughter. And so the nation of Moab and the nation of Ammon uh, are, are like cousins, first cousins, which means that they are then distant cousins of the Jewish people because Lot was Abraham's nephew. So they are distant relatives of the Jewish people. Uh, true or false, prosperity and great riches were to pour out on Moab. That's false. In verse uh, 3, uh, specifically it says, The sound of an outcry from Horonaim, devastation and great destruction. Moab is broken, or little ones have sounded out a cry of distress. Uh, and incidentally in verse 2, it says, Come, let us cut her off from being a nation. You too, madmen, will be silenced. The sword will follow after you. Madmen is the name of a city in Moab. It's, it's not talking about people that are mad. It's talking about, uh, the, that's the, actually the name of a city in, in Moab. Uh, and, and some of these other names here that I had never heard of before, that uh, Horonaim, Horonaim, Heshbon I had heard of, the Madmen I had not, Horonaim I had not, uh, and yet these are these are cities that are, or in Moab is where they come from. All right. Usually God gives reasons for his punishment, uh, at least in Old Testament times. Uh, God gave reason for his punishment. Uh, we don't have that, as we mentioned earlier, we don't have that luxury uh, today. Uh, Yeah, he gives reasons, uh, tells why he will, yeah, and why he will bless us, yeah. And it's the same as it was then, basically, that is, serve God, be faithful to him, he'll bless you, if you don't, he's going to punish you. I mean, that's, that's about as simple as you can get, but that's, you know, I couldn't tell you how many times God told the nation of Israel when they first came up out of the land of Egypt, if you will follow my law, you'll do what I tell you, I'll bless you, and you'll, you'll have an abundance. If you don't, then I'm going to punish you, and I'm going to destroy you. So, I mean, that's, that's about as simple as you can get, you know. It would be interesting to know how many times repent is in the Bible. Yeah. Repent means to turn from what you're doing. Yeah. Repent means to Yeah, it's a lot. You're right. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, as, as I mentioned previously, I will not be here 
uh, next week, and uh, Eric has graciously agreed to take the class. Uh, actually, he didn't refuse when I put him on the spot, but <laughs> we'll call that graciously accepting it. Uh, but we'll let him pick up right there with question number three and uh, go from there next week, Lord willing. Time to begin, we will do song number 551. And after this, I'll get Alex here. Okay. 551. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying.
Our Father in Heaven, we're so thankful for this evening that we've had to come together, that you have blessed us with health and opportunity to study your word a little bit more in this minute of Bible study. Father, we pray that you will be with those who are sick and recovering from surgeries and are experiencing health problems. Lord, we pray that you will bless them and restore their health and, and that we could in some way be a way to encourage and to help them if the need be. Father, we pray that you will be with us as we have just sung this song, that we would remember our duty to spread your love and to sow the seed that you have given to us of the hope that is in Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that you will forgive us from our sins as we repent of them, and we are so thankful for Jesus and the gift that has been given and the life that he lived and the death that he died, the blood that was shed so that we could be forgiven and that we can see how we should live ourselves. Father, we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 572. <coughs> There's a call comes ringing <laughs> on the restless wings in the different people up here that do the invitation. As I have said before, we don't know who's going to affect you. 
Some will like me. Some will be happy when I'm done. And we just don't know. We don't know who we're going to affect. So I think it's wise of the elders to change it around a little bit. Believe it or not, Brandon, you made me think for a whole week. His lesson was on purpose. And it made me think, especially when you're in the retirement age, what is your purpose after that? Are you sent out to the pasture and everybody's going to forget you? Or do you try to stay important? For me, it was a struggle that I want to stay busy. A lot of times you'll hear me say that I would rather wear out than rust out. And I seriously mean that. So you try to find something to do. So he made me think, you know, what purpose do I think I have in life right now? And I think my purpose in life, well, I know it is, is that I want to be home with the Father. I really do. So I try to live my life the best that I can. It's not a perfect life, but it's one that I know I can be forgiven if I ask. I want to be with God after a while. I know it's going to be a good place up there. Who is going to help me to get there? It's going to take Jesus. Jesus is able to furnish all of my needs, anything that I need to have. And a couple of examples that I can give you is that in John 6, 1 through 15, it talks about him feeding, I forgot my glasses, sorry, feeding 5,000 men. When you hear those numbers, it doesn't count the women and children. It's just the way the Bible is written. So that's a lot of people. But he did it with five barley loaves and two fish. And that's quite a miracle. I was looking up in John 20 and 25, and it mentions that if all the things were written down, the earth itself could not hold all that information. In instances like this, you have a lot of questions. How long did it take to feed them? Did they cook the fish? Did they cut the bread? How many baskets did they pass out to everybody? Well, I know there's at least 12, but that's all I know. So how long did it take? I really don't know. So that'd be a good instance. How many books of the Bible would it take to write all that down? Another instance is in Mark 8, 1 through 9, where he feeds 4,000 men. And they hadn't eaten for three days in that particular instance there. But he did that with seven loaves and a few fish. When they got all done, they were allowed to eat all that they wanted. You've got to remember that. It wasn't just here and this is all you get. They could eat as much as they want. They carried out seven large baskets of leftovers. So when I want to prepare on what my life is going to be, what my purpose in life is going to be. I want to trust in Jesus. I know that I have to. Because when he left, he said he's going to prepare a home for all of us if we're faithful. Just a minute. Okay, a couple of instances uh, that I know he can take care of us. I think all of us, when we give the invitation, we're trying to ask you, what do you think hell's like? And we really only hear a few examples that you're not going to like it. I know that. But if you give me a little liberty here, I would like to say that uh, the rich man, when he was suffering, he just wanted somebody just to put a couple drops of water on his lips. And he would feel so much better. Okay, bear with me. I'll give you a couple more. Um, other instances, the prodigal son had lost some money, spent it all. What did he want? He just wanted to go back home and just be a plain old person. So what am I trying to say here is your worst day on earth you're sick, you're hurting, things are going wrong. 
If you should wind up in hell, you're going to want to go back to earth. You really are. You want to go back home. It was much better there than what you were doing, even though it's your worst day on earth. But you want to go home. The only part that's kind of going to mess you up, well, it is going to mess you up, is home's not going to be there. The earth is going to be consumed by fire, and you will not have a home. So where you're at, it's going to be there for eternity. And that's all I can say about hell. You're just not going to like it. Please try to avoid it. We love you all. We're trying to encourage you to obey. You're all nice people. I trust all of you. But there's one step that you have to take, and you've got to do that on your own. So if we can help you in any manner, please come forward as we stand and sing this song. <clears throat> Jesus calls us over the Nelson had knee surgery uh, yesterday. He's doing okay. Uh, actually, he wanted to come tonight, and Melissa wouldn't let him. But uh, <laughs> really, <laughs> he says he says he's more bored than hurting. So I told him he goes to therapy. Yeah, <laughs> none of us will wear off. Father and God, we're just thankful for your love for us and for all you've given us. Thank you for this time we've had to come together and study your word. And we do pray, Father, for those that are sick, those that have had surgeries, those that are getting over surgery, those that are having surgery in the future. We just pray, Lord, you'll be with each of them. Pray, Father, for the Hobbs family, that you'll give them peace and comfort in your own way. We ask you to forgive us when we do wrong and help us to be what you want us to be. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Who is? No, 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 no,
one.